Parsha 101, Parsha's Toldos. This week's Torah portion focuses mainly on the life of Yitzchak. And there's this whole idea that Avraham, Yitzchak's father, Abraham represents kindness. So he went out and taught people and was open door, etc. Yitzchak, Isaac, represents Gvura, which is like self-discipline and severity. So he didn't, he wasn't the one who traveled and went out and all that sort of stuff. A lot of what we actually see what he did was, was digging wells. It's like, what's the deal with that? Well, the deeper meaning for that is digging deep. It's revealing what's concealed. So it's digging well is finding the water beneath. So self-discipline and severity in that regard is to dig deep and reveal what's concealed. So the name of the sixth Torah portion, Toldos, comes from the first verse. Vela Toldos Yitzchak ben Avram, Avram Holedos Yitzchak. These are the descendants of the generations of Yitzchak, the son of Avram. Avram gave birth to Yitzchak. And there's different explanations for why this verse seems to double the language. One of it is talks about how Yitzchak looked exactly like Abraham, so no one should doubt what his lineage was. Another point is that it's, it's something that the Rebbe spoke about that. Yitzchak ben Abraham, there are people who like to go out and brag about their lineage, say, oh, I'm the son of whomever, Yitzchak the son of Abraham. But the behavior should be reflective of Avram Hole de Yitzchak, Avram who gave birth to Yitzchak. The person's lineage should be able to brag about their children in that regard. So it's not just enough to say, oh, you know where I came from. A person's actions and deeds should actually reflect where they came from so that the ancestors could be like, oh, look at, look at this. So now the Torah portion starts off with Yitzchak and Rivka. Yitzchak had gotten married at the age of 40. And now they're at the point where Rivka, they're, they're dominating for her to have children. There's opinions that say that Yitzchak, that Rivka was three when she got married. So she couldn't have had children anyways for the first 10 years or so. So 10 years without, or however old she actually was when she got married, either way, it was 20 years into their marriage and there were no children. So it said they sort of, they, they daven opposite, like in different sides of the room. And so you have Yitzchak is davening, he's a tzaddik, the son of a tzaddik. And you have Rivka, she's a tzaddik, a righteous person, but she's the daughter of not a righteous person, of Lavan. So whatever it was, the prayers were answered and Rivka is now pregnant with twins. And it was actually a very painful pregnancy for her. And whenever she would pass by the yeshiva, the house of study of Shem and Aver, Shem, the descendant of Noach, the righteous. This is These are the, the righteous ones who kept the word of God within the line and never went astray like the other peoples eventually did. All of a sudden she's feeling the baby kicks to try to get out. But when she passed by a place of idolatry, all of a sudden she feels the baby kick to get out. So what's going on here? And so she said she went to go ask. And there's different things going on about, okay, so it's, Yaakov is fighting to get out by shame and aver, and uh, Esav is fighting to get out by a place of idolatry. But it says also there's deeper stuff going on here about they're fighting over the inheritance of both worlds, like they're fighting over the blessings of each world. That each one realizes that you want the, the material blessings can help with the spiritual blessings, etc. So what, they're fighting over who's going to get the blessings of the, of the physical material world versus the, the spiritual world, etc. Which also just goes to show that despite what Esav came to be, there was this potential within Asav, because if not, he wouldn't have been fighting for the spiritual world. Anyway, so Rivka can't figure out what's going on. So she's okay, I'm going to go find out the Yeshiva Shem and Aver. I'm going to go ask. This is going to be the conduit through which I could ask God the question. And that's when she's told, famous line, you have two nations and they're fighting within you. And one nation will always prevail over the other. And for anybody who studied Tanya, this is the source that the Alter Rebbe uses to say that we've got two inclinations, two drives fighting within us a drive for the physical, material world, and one for the spiritual world. And one will always overcome the other. And whichever one we feed more and give more attention to, that will be the one that will be stronger. So the time comes to give birth, and first comes out is Asa, and he has a ruddy complexion in which people say, okay, this is not a good sign that, he, that he's all red all over, and it was hairy all over, it says. So Asa, from the word of a soy that was bo- born like complete. And then Yaakov is holding on to the heel of Asa. And that's where his name Yaakov comes from, Eka, the heel. Now, just a side note, it says, you know, if you have a jar, whatever goes, whatever comes out last was actually the first one in. So even though Asa was born first, it says that Yaakov was kind of created first. Anyways, he's still trying to be the firstborn. That's why he's clutching onto the heel over there. Anyways, so you have these two sons, which of course Yaakov is going to represent the type of child or the path of someone who's innately virtuous and fulfills that potential. And Asa represents, even though he didn't fulfill the potential, but Asa represents those who have to overcome materialistic desires and drives 
to become virtuous. Um, then it speaks about how the, the children grew up, and it says that Esav ensnared his father. Um, Yitzhak, he would say things to him to, to be like, oh, how do you do tithing of salt, which is like an irrelevant question, but trying to like kind of sweet talk his father. And even though Yitzhak kind of knew that Esav had this thing, he was he, he kind of, I guess you say, kind of fell for it. And then, but in truth, he was really a wild hunter and he was not a great person. And it says Yaakov studied in the tent. Yaakov was a, was, a, was an innocent, pure kind of person. Now, it says, so there, thereby Yitzchak loved Esav and Rivka loved Yaakov. And also, kind of like a side thing, going back to something original, Yitzchak's whole thing was digging, revealing what's concealed. So part of this whole thing, Yitzchak loved Esav, is that he wanted to, get, to reveal the concealed. He knew that Esav had a great potential. He just didn't necessarily realize how far he had gone, that he wasn't necessarily coming back from it. But he wanted to reveal what Esav, the potential that Esav had inside of him, that like goes to the well digging. And we even see that Ace of descendants, eventually along the line, there'd be a lot of converts coming from Ace of, and a lot of great people came from those converts. There were converts who came from those converts. Um, for example, you have Avadia, that's Obadiah the, the prophet. You have great sages of the Talmud, Shmaya and Talian, the great Rabbi Akiva, the great Rabbi Meir, who's quoted all over the Gemara, and Uncleus, who was a Roman convert. So Rome comes from Ace of, and he, he did the Aramaic translation of the Torah which is also considered like a commentary by seeing certain words that are used in translation that offers commentary. And that is printed in almost very frequently, like almost it's printed in almost every text. So these foremost people, we see there's a great potential there. Okay, so now everything happens. So what happens now? One day Yaakov is at home and he's cooking up lentils. Why is he cooking up lentils? Because Avram had just passed away. Avram was supposed to live to the age of 180. He passed away at the age of 175 because God had promised Avram that he would die in peace, and Asa had come, he was coming of age now, and even though he kind of behaved very nicely, he's about to take a sharp left turn. So to spare Avram what his grandson, to see what his grandson was gonna be, Avram passed away at the age of 175. And Yaakov's cooking lentils to console his father. Lentils are round, it represents the circle of life, etc. Asa comes in and he is famished, he is so hungry. And it says that uh, he had come off of doing some moral stuff. It might have been his first murder he committed. Not great stuff was going on. He comes in, he sees what's going on. He's like, feed me that red, red stuff. And the word red, Edom. So that's why he was known, he would become known as Edom. So we know the descendants of Asa will refer to Edom, like the nation of Edom. Now we're in the, after the second temple was destroyed by Rome, it's called Gullus Edom. We're in the exile of Edom now. It refers to all the descendants, the whole nation that he became. So of course, Yaakov says, oh, you want the lentils? You got to sell the birthright. And uh, kind of, if this is not necessarily the commentary speak about what was the conversation they were having, Yaakov knows that part of the birthright, originally the firstborns were supposed to serve in the temple. And there's a lot of sacrifices that go along with that and whatever. And Asa's like, what's the big deal to you? Like, why is this so important to you? And he's like, oh, I want to be part of the sacrifices, whatever. And by the way, do you know, there's a lot of rules that go along with the sacrifices. And someone who doesn't necessarily this rule or that rule, they might even be put to death from it. And Asav is like, oh, this is going to kill me anyway. So what do I need this for? And he, and he sells it. And Yaakov says, you got to take an oath. You got to swear that this is outright mine. I don't want any strings attached or anything like that. And again, he sells it, right? He eats, eats. The text says he eats, he drinks, he leaves, and he spurns the birthright that he had. Now the story cuts a little bit, and it talks about how there was a famine in the land, and Yitzchak went to, to King Avimelech in Gor, which is the land of the Philistines. Basically, Hashem comes to him and he says, you know, when Avram, there was a famine, he went down to Egypt, and the whole story with, with Pharaoh happened. God basically tells him, don't go there, you gotta go to Avimelech, which is sort of Israel proper, it's not really Israel proper, but it kind of is, and eventually will become of Israel proper, because of everything that happened with the, uh, with the Akkad of, of Yitzhak almost, almost being sacrificed, that he, he gained a, a very holy elevated status. He said, you can't leave the vicinity of the Holy Land. You cannot go down to Egypt. You stay here and um, you know, basically go to Avimelech. I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna be with you. Your descendants are gonna own this land. Basically all the promises and the blessings I gave to Avram, your father are now gonna trans are transferred over to you. And your, your descendants are gonna be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Nations will bless themselves by your descendants. Etc. Because Avram heeded my voice and he fulfilled my commandments, etc. So Yitzchak goes to the land of the Philistines, Rabbi Malchus, and people, ah, oh, who's this beautiful woman, Rivka? Oh, she's my sister. Okay, goes the whole storyline again. 
Now, nobody specifically, nothing specific, nobody specifically touched her at this point, but after he was there for a while, and after a certain point, he kind of lets his guard down, and okay, now we could, uh, we don't have to worry about anybody watching us. But people were watching them, and Avimelech, the king, realizes what's going on, and he's like, hey, what is this thing you told us about her being your sister? She's not your sister. Like, you guys are behaving like husband and wife, you know? And so, you know, how dare you have done this? I could have, we could have had a terrible thing on our hands if somebody would have gone after her, if I would have gone after her. So you would have brought guilt upon all of us. And it's like, hey, you know, I didn't want to be killed because of her, etc. So Avimelech, the king says, anybody who touches any of them will be put to death. Okay, fine. So Yitzchak settles there and he stays there for a while. It says he sowed grain and he reaped like a hundredfold. And all of a sudden he's raking it in. And God is blessing him to be super duper successful with flocks and herds and business ventures and everything like that. Basically people are seeing it and he's so insanely wealthy and they're all very jealous of him. So it says that they blocked up the wells that his father's servants had dug. And there's this whole situation that goes on. And then basically the mouth of the king tells him, you know, get out of it. You're more profitable than us. And so just, just go, you gotta get out of here. And so it's like the, he, he's allowed to leave in peace, you know, and he, and he goes. And then um, it says that he redug the wells that his father's servants had dug. And then there's a whole story with him with these three wells that he digs. So he digs one, and then the shepherds are fighting with him, and they, whatever. And then he digs another one, shepherds are fighting, and whatever. The third one he digs, and, and nobody bothers anybody, and it's just left. And so there's actually a whole thing about the three wells are representative of the three base amikdash, the three holy temples that the first one was destroyed, the second one was destroyed, but the third one's going to last forever, like it's going to be left. Okay, so now Yitzchak goes to Be'er Sheva, and God appears to him, him there, and he says, I'm the God of your father. Um, you know, gives him all the uh, blessings, etc. Yitzchak dil- digs another well. There's a whole uh, there's a whole uh, well digging situation theme going on here, right, with him. And then Abi Malch shows up with the chief of his of his troops. He's like, "Hey, what are you guys doing here? I thought you don't like me." It's like, "No, we see that God's with you, and He's blessed you very much, and we want to make a peace treaty with you." Okay, so they eat, they drink, they stay the night. And the next morning, they make an oath, and then the servants come. They're like, "Hey, look, we found water in the well! Hooray!" It says the whole thing that. This name is now affirmed to be Be'er Sheva, and the name is Be'er Sheva to this day. So we do, there's a city in Israel, Be'er Sheva, it's right there. Then it talks about, now, let's skip ahead, we're in the year 2148, the Hebrew year. Asaph, Asaph, so the twins are now 40 years old. And Asaph is like, you know what, my father got married at 40, I'm going to get married at 42. So even though for the past 25 years, he's been engaging in extremely immoral behavior, and he's been taking married women, doing whatever he wants with them, but oh no, look, see, I'm going to go get married. That's why Asaph is, com- is compared to um, to a pig, they say. The same way a pig has his whole body trafe in the mud and he sticks out his hooves to say, oh, look, split split hooves, it's kosher. This Asaph was kind of like that. So he, he marries these two women and they are idolaters. Not great, not great situation. Okay, now we skip ahead a couple years and we're in the year of the blessings now. So this is the year 2171. It's 23 years later. Yitzchak is 123 years old, and he's getting old, and his eyesight is dimming. They say different things about that. Either when he was going to be sacrificed, the angels cried, and the tears fell into his eyes, and it kind of eventually caused him to go blind. They say that the smoke of the incense of Esau's wives caused him to go blind, not because specifically smoke can do that, but because Yitzchak was at such a holy, elevated status. So even something that was so rem- that was so connected to idolatry physically affected him. And they say also, because of this whole story that's going to unfold with the blessings, God didn't want to just say, hey, look, Asaph's not a great guy, don't give it to him. He didn't want to speak negatively against him. So instead, he allowed his eyesight to dim. So this is the uh, care that God took to not speak negatively against someone. And we can take the same care to just go out of the way to not specifically speak negatively against someone. Anyways, Yitzhak summons Asaph, and Asaph's like, here I am. And he says, okay, I don't know when the day of my death is going to be. I'm getting old. I don't know when the day of my death is going to be. Commentaries say that as a general rule, people, there's a high likelihood of them passing away within five years, plus or minus, of a parent of their parents' death. So Yitzchak is now 123 years old. Sarah passed away at 127. Avram lived much longer, 175, but now he's within the first set of five. So he's getting a little bit nervous. He says, okay, sharpen up your weapons and trap for me some game. As said, don't go steal it, you know, trap it for me. Um, deer speaking about and prepare delicacies that I like that I, that I like and I'm gonna eat it I'm gonna bless you with the the blessings of my soul basically and uh, Yisav is very excited about all this and he sets off Rifkin in the meantime overhears the conversation and she's like nah this is no good 
Yitzchak, even though he recognized that Esav was not the perfect son, he figured I'm going to give him the blessings and that's going to elevate him. It's going to make him, you know, the well digging situation. But Rivka knew that Esav wouldn't be able to handle these blessings. He had not made, he was not a proper vessel to receive them. Either it would have been too much, he wouldn't have been able to handle them, or he could have just like flat out died from getting them. Which is, this is Hasidic interpretation of these things, but because of course there's a lot of great spiritual elements going on here, not just a simple story. Many dimensions to understanding Torah, so this is kind of what's going on. So Rivka calls Yaakov and she's like, listen up, we got we to gotta get you in there and you're going to take the blessings. These are not for Esav to have, you get them. Also, right, technically, Yaakov, he got the firstborn, he should get the blessings. And get me two kid goats and I'm going to prepare them for you because you can kind of make them taste like deer meat and you're going to get the blessings. And Yaakov's like, I got smooth skin, I, but you know, my father's going to know right away. And what if because of this, everything backfires and I get cursed because of it. And Rivka's like, if there's any curses, you know, I take them upon myself. Shalom was sort of self-sacrifice she was going to have now to ensure that Yaakov got the blessings. Which of course is going to inspire Yaakov because this is not his way of doing things. Yaakov is not like a trickster, manipulator. He doesn't, he's a very honest, complete, simple person. He doesn't, he doesn't work like this. But this is, he sees this is what has to be done. So he does what he has to do. And then Rivka dresses him in ace of clothes and she takes this skin of the kid, the kid goats, and she puts it on his arms and on his neck so that he should be a pair hairy, basically. And then Yaakov goes in to his father. And he's like, father, and he's like, who are you, my son? And he says, um, I am, Esav is your firstborn. So it depends on where you put the punctuation there. That he didn't, uh, he didn't specifically lie necessarily. Then he says, okay, please arise and sit, you know, partake of this, this what I brought of you. And then Yitzchak, like, oh, you brought this so quickly. And Yaakov's like, oh, God, your God, help me in my way, you know, to find everything. He arranged it all. And Yitzchak's like, getting a little suspicious about the way his son, quote unquote, son Esav is speaking so politely, so nicely talking about God, you know. So when he comes closer to him, he, he feels him. He says, oh, the famous line, the voice, the voice of Yaakov and the hands of the hands of Esav. And this wasn't just, um, you know, a phrase that said, this is a description of the way their lives would be. That yet Esav would forever live by his hands, as in by the sword, by fighting, and Yaakov's strength would always be in his voice. And it says voice twice, right? The voice is the voice of Yaakov, because the voice of prayer and the voice of Torah study. These are the strengths of the children of Yaakov. It says a general idea, when the voice of Yaakov, as in the children of Yaakov, they're raised in the hall, in the study hall. As long as we continue to study the Torah and practice the Torah and all these things, then the hands of Esau can't harm them. That's what the Medrash says about this. And also, there's kind of a thing about Yaakov kind of going in dressed like Esau. So another deeper explanation of that is that in the world today, it might seem like certain people, certain Jewish people, they look to be in the dress of Esau, quote unquote. They don't outwardly seem super Jewish per se, but that's only their exterior. Inside is still Yaakov. Inside, the truth of who they are is still Yaakov. Anyways, so Yitzchak says, okay, and he's going to give him 10 blessings now. 10 blessings, which Friday, uh, Saturday night, Shabbos night, after Shabbat is over, when Abdallah said, after that, there's, there's a few passages that are said blessings that people give to each other. And part of it comes from these blessings now, that God should give you the dew of the heaven and the, the fat of the land, as in like the choices of the land. You should have abundance of grain and of wine. People should serve you. The nations will bow to you. You'll be a master of your brothers. Your, your mother's sons will prostrate before you. Those who curse you shall be cursed, and those who bless you shall be blessed. Then, as soon as he finished, finished eating, finished blessing, Yaakov leaves, and in the next second, Esav comes. So literally one leaving as the other enters. And Esav's, all right, here we go. Stand up and you know partake of this. Arise and partake of this. And part of what it is, we see Yaakov was like, please stand up and partake of this, etc. And he's like, you know, get up and partake of this. So on the one hand, Esau has great respect for his father. And there's different actions that we see that Esau does do in deference to his father. But even though he's doing it right, he's not necessarily doing the right thing in the right way. So doing the right thing also requires or should be complemented with doing it in a refined way, doing it in a, in the, in a nice way. So it's like all of a sudden, wait, wait a second, who are you? It's like, I'm Esau, you're I'm base of your firstborn. So it says that Yitzchak was was um, overcome with this great trembling. He was very fearful. Commentaries say that the, he saw the Gehenna, 
open up beneath the feet of Esav. So first of all, oh yeah, this one's definitely Esav. Yaakov had a smell of Gan Eden about him, and Esav is like, okay, Gehenim's here, oh, oh dear. And also because he's like, what have I just done? What did it, I just bungled the whole blossom thing. So he said, wait a second, so who was here before? He, he's also going to be blessed. I guess he's indeed, he, he's going to be blessed. And then Esav lets out a bitter cry that he's like, oh, this, this brother of mine, Yaakov, is from this word of like ensnarement. He's ensnared me twice. Have you no blessings left for me? And Yitzhak's like, wait a second, wait a second. What do you mean he, he uh, trapped you twice? What do you mean? He said, well, the first time is the, was the firstborn and the second time is this. So Yitzhak knew, oh, okay, I gave the blessings to the right, to the, to the true firstborn. Um, and then he's like, okay, do you not have any blessings left for me? He's like, well, what good is it going to be? I just made him master over you. And whatever you're going to have, a servant, everything that, that they own belongs to their master. And so, and he's like, please, you know, you got to, and he's crying out and the whole situation. So Yitzhak's like, all right, all right, all right, I'll give you a blessing. You know, you should have the fat of land and do of the heaven, which actually it refers to the commentary say that your mightiest descendants are going to settle on the Italian peninsula, which Edom, Rome, is, Rome is considered, there you go, the Italian peninsula. And it says you're going to live by the sword, you're going to serve your brother, you know, sometimes you're going to be able to throw off his yoke. Um, and then it says after that, that Asaph hated his brother and he harbored, of course, deep hatred toward him. But he said to himself, you know, the days of mourning for my father are coming soon. Once he dies, I'm going to go after Yaakov, I'm going to kill him. So he did respect his father. I'm not going to kill him while he's still alive, but I'm going to get after him. Now, Rivka knows what's going on. So she calls Yaakov and she says, you got to get out. Lovan has it out for you and he's going to kill you. Go to my brother Lavan and Haran and until his rage abates and then I'll, I'll call for you. So, and then Rivka tells Yitzchak, she's like, I can't handle this. If Yaakov's going to marry any of the local girls, like, what am I living for anymore? I can't, these girls are, you know, we can't have the Canaanite girls. They were adulterous, ter- terrible people. So Yitzchak calls Yaakov and he says, listen, go to Padam Aram, Padam Aram, go to um, your mother's family, basically, and you'll take a wife from them there. And God should bless you to be fruitful and, and numerous. And basically, all the blessings that, that God gave to Abraham, that were given to him, I'm giving them now to you. Right, that the land, the descendants, great nations, etc. So, Yaakov listens, and he gets out. He tells it out of there, and then the Torah portion ends off. Says that Esau sees what's going on, and he goes and he marries someone. He said, "Oh, my father doesn't like the Kanani woman. He already had two wives from them. Oh, he doesn't like it. Okay, so he goes and he marries someone from the family of Yishmael. And that is where this Torah portion ends off.